Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome to the second channel here on Smarter Every Day. The video you're about to watch is the leftover footage from the United Launch Alliance rocket factory tour I took of the Decatur facility. That's where they create Atlas rockets, Delta rockets. They're working on the new Vulcan rocket. It's an amazing tour with the CEO of ULA, Tori Bruno. Tori is a extremely intelligent person. He is a sharp dude. If you haven't watched it, you need to go watch the main factory tour. There were so many questions I wanted to ask because rockets are something that get me really excited, but, but it didn't really fit in the main video because some of it's like talking about other companies or political issues and things like that or how you do guidance and control for a rocket and how, well, specifically ULA does it. ULA is well known for being very, very accurate with their orbital insertions with their rockets. So the first little topic we're gonna talk about here is that. Then we get into some rocket engine discussion. And then after that, we talk about Tori Bruno's competitors and the strategy he sees and where he sees himself in the market. So all this is incredibly fascinating stuff from the horse's mouth. Um, Tori Bruno, I call him a space cowboy. He, he likes horses and stuff. He, he is a cowboy out, out west, but um, he also runs a rocket company. So it's, it's an amazing thing to have access at this level. So I hope you enjoy this. I'll do my best to ask good questions and um, I'll see you at the end of the video. So the brains that drives the Centaur, where is that at? Is it, are you integrating uh, GNC at this point? We are. So on the back end of that is a flight controls computer and you know inertial measurement sensor and other sensors. Uh, rate sensors that are the guidance system. They're always attached to the upper stage, obviously, because if you attached them to the booster and separated, you would have lost your brains. So they're always up here. Got it. And wh when does the software get loaded? The software will get loaded before we go down to the Cape, but then it gets, of course, checked out there, and we have the ability to update parameters in that software literally less than 60 seconds before ignition. And the reason we do that is because we handle winds a little bit differently than other launch providers do. So the conventional way to deal with winds is you program your software and your trajectory, you look in the almanac for the forecast from NOAA about what the jet stream will be doing at the time you intend to launch. And then you load in a trajectory that can, comp you know, that can deal with that. So if you have a very high velocity wind, you might steer into it and then come back out. And then you get there, you launch balloons during the countdown to make sure that the wind is not in a direction or a strength that you can handle based on that programming you put in six months earlier. We're different. We launch the balloons, see what it's doing, discover, oh look, the wind is different than was anticipated. We reprogram those parameters on the fly, run it through our simulation lab back in Colorado, recertify that trajectory, load it back onto the rocket, like I said, as less than a minute before launch as possible, and then away we go. So you have adaptive guidance and control systems. How do you... We do. But, but, but software configuration control is huge. It is. So how, how do you recertify on the fly? So those are parameterized, so we're not changing the base code, we're changing constants within the code, and the way we certify our software to begin with is with a hardware in the loop simulation laboratory. And we have that lab up running and with people staffing it throughout the countdown so that if we need to change the parameters, we do. That's amazing. I never would have guessed that that's what you do. Yeah, and when that's all on the pad, once the rocket is flying, it can also reprogram its own parameters autonomously and adjust its own trajectory. So some customers will say to us, okay, here's what I need you to do. I need you to you know, get me to this inclination and perhaps this apogee, uh, this argument, uh, and that'll be good, but gosh, you know, if I could have a little bit steeper inclination or a little bit more uh, altitude, that would be better if the rocket happens to perform better that day or the conditions and wind allow that. I wish I could have it if you have it. That's actually what you did for Parker Solar Probe. That's exactly right. And you extended right. the life of the mission because of that. We did. So we load that in ahead of time, and then as the rocket is flying, it measures its own performance and says, oh, look, I don't need as much propellant reserve. I will commit that to the mission, reprogram, reshape my own trajectory, and burn that all the way to depletion. And it's all inertial? Uh, it's, yes. Yeah, no, it is. It's all inertial, and it's all autonomous. 
We do bring in GPS, but for really uh, range safety purposes. Uh, in later versions of the rocket, we may have a blended navigation system. So coming back to this business of oxygen rich, so traditionally American-made engines have been fuel rich always because the combustion is more stable, you can operate it at a little bit lower pressure, and most importantly they run cooler and are less corrosive in the engine itself. The Russians actually pioneered the oxygen rich cycle. When you use it as an oxygen rich, um, a sort of a slightly above the ideal or stoichiometric mixture ratio, you get more of the fuel burned, less of it goes through the engine without combusting, so right away you're getting more energy. You run it a little bit hotter, and so you just get much, much higher performance. It's higher ISP. Higher ISP. The downside is it is much more corrosive. And so the Russians found it necessary to put all kinds of sort of uh, complex coatings inside the engine in order to survive that environment. And at the end of the Cold War, when the United States government didn't want the Russian rocket scientists wandering off to places like North Korea, they asked us if we could use that RD-180 engine. And we said, well, yes, we'd love to, and we put it under the Atlas. As we move forward to Vulcan, this engine gets retired and it gets replaced with an American-made engine also be an oxygen-rich stage combustion cycle. Got it. So we're bringing that technology ashore with better manufacturing technology to go with it. So I've always wondered why you used Russian engines. And the question for me was, do we not have the technology to make the engines? And you're saying that it was a strategic decision. It was, yeah, at the time. At the time, it was the highest performance engine of that class that would be appropriate for a booster that was actually available and because the State Department wanted that as an element of their diplomacy with the now former Soviet Union we were asked to use it and we were happy to do so. Yeah because despite all the stuff that's going on I mean space is the one place where partnerships still exist and, and exactly yeah it's yeah. a big deal. So, so you are still ordering Russian rocket engines for Atlas? We've ordered our last, but the Russians are still delivering them. And what about Delta? So Delta has an American-made Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-68 engine on it. Also a great engine, great performance, but the other kind of engine cycle, so a fuel-rich cycle. Gotcha. And so, if I understand correctly, the Vulcan rocket is going to use your competitor, Blue Origin. Yes. It's going to use their engine. Yes. And I know you well enough to know that that's strategic. It is. Okay, now what's the idea there? <laughs> so you, you've got Blue Origin that you're you're attaching yourself at the hip with Blue Origin. We are. To, to fly your rocket. What are you doing, Tori? Yeah. Level with me. So the funny thing about our industry is it's really small. And we have a word we like to use, competimate. And so it is not unusual for us to have a competitor that is also in our supply chain or is buying missions from us. And so in the case of Blue Origin, uh, developing an engine from scratch is a giant investment and it takes a lot of time to work that technology. And they had been working on that engine for years before we got together on this new Vulcan rocket. So we were able to shorten our development cycle by several years. They brought most of the investment to develop the engine and then the two rockets that we will fly are in very different classes. So even though we are competing, it's not exactly one to one. And together, because they intend to bring all of their engines back, and we will start out at least initially as an expendable, together we have enough production rate to make the engine affordable. But you're also, there's also some cleverness there because Congress sets the laws that right. give you money and so you are tying yourself to Blue Origin. Are you trying to be too big to fail? No, no, that really wasn't part of it. That really wasn't. It was mostly about the price of the engine on a recurring basis and building enough engines every year to make that affordable. Without us, the engine price would be very, very high and it would make their rocket much less affordable than with us together. And you picked on the engine, but I'll point out also that the solid rocket booster is kind of in the same situation. So Northrop Grumman, which is now owns ATK, that's one company now, makes our SRBs. They are also a competitor in the launch market with their Antares vehicle that flies cargo 
and with their new offering for national security space in this launch service procurement competition that's going on right now. And it kind of the same story in a way. They brought all of the investment for that SRB that I'm going to use themselves, and together we have enough rate to make it affordable. I know the internet, you know the internet, everybody's thinking about SpaceX because they've got a really good social media game, let's be yes, honest, yes, and they, they also do. have really interesting rockets. Yeah. If I understand the rocket science, you are building rockets for specific missions. We are. In an effort to set yourself apart and get a niche part of the market, can you just quickly describe what that is? I mean, I understand different payloads and lift capacities. Sure, yeah. What, what are you doing? Because there's some strategy here. Yeah. So you could think of the marketplace as having two big domains. One is commercial markets for commercial spacecraft operators and builders. Things like Dish TV, Direct TV, uh, you know, um, broadband internet that's you know sitting out at geostationary orbit. That's its own kind of market with lots of international uh, providers that become your customers. Then there is a national security space market that is much closer to the NASA exploration market and they use different capabilities. There's a little bit of overlap. Providers in both places can fly some of the other guys' missions, but we have really centered over here because what's important to us is to serve the national security in exploration needs. Uh, we want to do that personally, we want to do it as a team. From a business point of view, it's a much more stable marketplace and you're able to, to provide higher performance rockets that deliver more exquisite payloads and therefore it's a little bit better from a business standpoint in terms of what you're able to build and therefore charge. This other marketplace is so much more volatile. It goes up, it goes down. Right now it's in a big, long, multi-year slump. So we have made a deliberate choice that this market where we are the experts, when you look at the national security space constellations that are on orbit today, you can find one GPS satellite that was launched by somebody else. Everything else is us. We've been doing this for decades. We're really, really good at it. We know exactly what they need. And we like being there and it's a more stable market, so we're going to leverage our capability to be the top competitor there and let the other guys focus on that commercial marketplace and occasionally launch a national security payload. So, so what would you say to the person on the internet that when they think rockets in space, they think SpaceX and Elon? Yeah. What, what's, your, what's your response to that? Well, I think, first of all, that it's great to have competition. It really is. It makes the industry healthier. It's part of why I'm developing a new Vulcan rocket, and it's good for the taxpayer. So all of that's good. I'll also point out that as we look into the future, in national security, the country has a new challenge. Space is now contested, and in fact, it is now considered a warfighting domain, just like land, air, and sea. That's a big deal. The last time we had a new warfighting domain was 100 years ago when air was added. And as the country faces into that challenge, having a broader industrial base to meet that with is a good thing for us as Americans. So you're, you're gearing yourself up for multi-domain operations. You got it. So Space Force. You have it exactly. Okay, so you're thinking about the Space Force even though it doesn't exist right now. That's right. And I am investing in capabilities not just in Vulcan, but after Vulcan as it involves, evolves, um, that we're not talking about today that are really for that challenge the country has in front of it. All right, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching this, the second channel. If you would consider subscribing to Smarter Every Day 2 here, that's where you get the in-depth stuff, like the raw data from slow-mo or like real detailed stuff having to do with science and uh, interviews like this. So big thanks to Tori Bruno from United Launch Alliance. Feel free to follow him on Twitter. You can follow Smarter Every Day on Twitter if you're into that sort of thing. We interact quite a bit there. And uh, a big thanks to all the patrons of Smarter Every Day that support Smarter Every Day at patreon.com slash smarter every day. I'm grateful for all the support and I'm grateful that you took the time to watch this video. Feel free to hit the bell here on the second channel. There's not a lot of people subscribe to this channel, but I'm cool with that. This is for like the people that really like science. Anyway, I'm Destin. I appreciate you. Have a good one. Bye.